мною принято решение о проведении специальной военной операции. Ее цель – защита людей, которые на протяжении 8 лет подвергаются издевательствам, геноциду со стороны киевского режима. И для этого мы будем стремиться к демилитаризации и денацификации Украины, а также приданию суду тех, кто совершил многочисленные кровавые преступления против These fireballs that you're seeing in the near ground are important and chilling. Here's what we've learned. Europe's largest nuclear power plant, the largest one on the continent, is in southern Ukraine. And this moment, it's reportedly being shelled by Russian troops. We're going to... Walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. I love Pennsylvania Avenue. And we're going to the Capitol. We're tr going to try and give them the kind of pride and boldness that they need to take back our country. <laughs> Members of the mob violently clashed with outnumbered police, and in some instances appeared to be looking for members of Congress. Fucking hey. hey, man. Glad to see you guys. You guys are fine. Thank you for allowing the United States of America to be reborn. Thank you for allowing us to get rid of the communists, the globalists, and the traitors within our government. We love you and we thank you. In Christ's holy name we pray. Yeah! A gunman with an assault rifle targeting a Washington, D.C. spot that's at the center of a fake news story about Hillary Clinton. This case shows how fake news can lead to a dangerous situation. Of Salisbury, North Carolina, has been arrested and charged with assault with a dangerous weapon. And police say that told them that he showed up at the D.C. pizza restaurant to get to the bottom of what appears to be an utterly bogus story about child abuse promoted on the Internet. 9.54 a.m. Saturday morning. Tragedy strikes as a morning of prayer quickly shifts to a morning of deadly chaos. In under a minute, police rushing to the scene of an active shooter at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh early Saturday morning. According to the FBI hurled words of hate against Jews as he murdered them. On the shooting attacks on two mosques in the New Zealand city of Christchurch, 49 people are known to have died. Unprecedented is how police are describing this attack. Scores dead as two mosques are targeted during Friday prayers. People ran for their lives but many did not make it. She'd also posted a manifesto online expressing extreme white supremacist views. False rumors turned into real violence. Gangs of men in a Paris suburb went after local Roma people after hearing that members of the minority group were kidnapping children. Armed with batons and baseball bats, young men terrorized this encampment. Monday night, 15 people came. They came with gas to make a fire. They told us we were going to die with our children. They accused everyone. This is not normal. This is racism. Let me pivot over to the other breaking story out of Toronto, where we now know that police have been questioning the driver uh, behind the wheel of this white van who basically mowed people down for as long as a mile. This is north of Toronto. This is right around 1.30 uh, their time. Uh, details as far as the, the extent of the injuries. I mean, we, we heard... Uh, gruesome, gruesome details from some of these eyewitnesses. He said he thought it was unfair that nice guys like himself could not get a date and said he discovered a group of like-minded men online. I know of several other guys over the internet who uh, feel the same way, but I know they are, I would consider them uh, too cowardly to uh, act on their anger. My name is Mark and I'm a mid-30s male living in the United States. Um, my relationship with QAnon um, was a brief one. I was in the movement uh, two years ago, <coughs> um, maybe 
for two or three months tops um, before I became disillusioned with some of the claims being made within the conspiracy world. And um, so I, I looked a little, you know, more deeply into the claims being made and it fell apart, but I had been uh, an avid conspiracy theorist for about nine years, eight or nine years um, prior to joining QAnon. And so it was kind of like a domino that fell backwards and toppled every other belief that I had had in other conspiracies related to the paranormal, the Illuminati, Pizzagate, 9-11, you know, September 11th. Um, there was absolutely for me this concept of um, feeling like you were like, uh, like you were a part of a, a group of individuals that were fighting for justice and um, that, you know, you were on the right side of history. You were on the right side of like a battle between good and evil, um, that we were the good guys. And it, this concept of privilege and kind of ego stroking and that when, when these posts would be made on uh, 4chan and 8chan and some other kind of um, obscure internet sites, um, Q, this individual, whoever it happened to be, um, was very intent on stroking the egos of the, the uh, you know, Q supporters and talking about, you know, basically telling us like we were America's only hope and we had to continue to believe in Q and, and you know, support Trump and fight for him uh, because we were like the privileged few that, that were able to like, I don't know, know the truth or understand it. Um, fairly textbook cult leader type behavior that I know I know now. So I think that's probably why so many conspiracy theorists are uh, politically aligned with the right or Republican or conservative, because there's kind of a, a pretty large number of conservatives that are have an echo chamber of, um, you know, believing that it's them versus the world and that everyone on the opposite side, they're not legitimate people with just different views about the economy they're wrong and bad um and when you believe that the other is bad um you you can pretty much justify any sort of insane theories which is where i found myself uh, there's this very powerless feeling you get when you're convinced that you know the whole world is full of corruption and evil and your govern you know your neighbor's probably a communist a spy or something um yeah, I was I was pretty angry, angsty, depressed, and I I know for a fact that I, I've heard a lot of testimonies of people that come out of conspiracies that would you know attest to the same thing. Um, it's a very dark worldview, and my life is significantly improved and happier and better having left that behind. So I went on to Google and I typed in Q QAnon conspiracy debunked, um, and. I started looking at posts that a lot of critics uh, and critical thinkers had made online saying, going post by post with every, you know, post that he had made and saying, look, this, this is clearly incorrect or wrong or inaccurate. And here are four reasons why. Um, uh, as I said, I realized, wait a minute, there's, I need to learn how to be a critical thinker. I think it's really important to learn how to think. Um, to th and learn how to think critically, um, you know, learn about even just the foundations of, of arguments and truth and um, how do we know information is true? How does, how does science work? How does philosophy work? How do we, um, you know, how do we build upon the ideas that we have about the, the you know, the world and, and the framework of the world we live in um, to reach valid conclusions? The spread of false information has led to the rapid increase in discriminatory behavior towards science, politics, ethnic and religious groups, sexual orientation, and gender. While some falsehoods are being spread with good intent, this isn't always the case. Misinformation or disinformation. Misleading information is spread regardless of intent to mislead. This is often an unwitting spread of false information. The spreader may not intend to do this. They might have even thought the information to be true. Let's say you saw a poster claiming your favorite musician will be in town next week, and you tell all your friends about it. 
They get hyped up and tell the others until somebody tries to buy tickets for it, only to find out it's a poster from last year's show. Your intent was not to present false information, but this is what you have done. This is misinformation. Disinformation is knowingly spreading false information, such as Ted claiming that everyone's favorite artist will perform live at his place after all. The key information here is intent. Most people don't intend to spread misinformation. Avoiding the spread of misinformation. To avoid the spread of misinformation or disinformation, we must think critically. Critical thinking in practice. The following history of the breakthrough discovery of hand washing illustrates the role critical thinking played in this life saving medical practice. One of the best ways to prevent the spread of the flu and other viruses is to wash one's hands. Today, this may seem like common sense, but it wasn't until the mid 19th century that some doctors in the United States and Europe began to wash their hands before examining patients, and even then, only in certain cases. An early proponent of hand washing was Ignaz Semmelweis, a Hungarian doctor who worked at the Vienna General Hospital between 1844 and 1848. Its maternity wing was so big that it was divided into two wards, one for doctors and their students, and one for midwives and their students. Between 1840 and 1846, the maternal mortality rate for the midwives ward was 36.2 per 1,000 births, while the mortality rate for the doctors wards was 98.4 per 1,000 births. Semmelweis looked for any differences between the wards. Dana Tulochetki, a philosophy professor at Purdue University, explains that one difference was that in the doctors division, a priest regularly passed through and rang a bell as a last sacrament to the dying women. Semmelweis wondered if women were dying because of the psychological terror of hearing the bell. So even if they weren't actually dying, they would hear the bell and think it was their time. Semmelweis rerouted the priest, but it made no difference. Then, in 1847, the death of Semmelweis's colleague, Jacob Kolechka, led him to a breakthrough. Kolechka had cut his finger on a scalpel during an autopsy and developed an infection that killed him. Semmelweis wondered whether a similar type of infection occurred in the doctor's maternity ward. He realized that, unlike the hospital's midwives, doctors sometimes perform autopsies before examining women in the maternity ward. In the absence of germ theory, Semmelweis theorized Kolechka had died because cadaveric matter entered his body through his wound, and that women in the doctor's ward might also be dying because cadaveric matter from doctors' hands was entering their body through their genitalia. Although this was incorrect, Semmelweis began mandating that doctors wash their hands with chlorinated lime after autopsies. And it was a big improvement. Between 1848 and 1859, the maternal mortality rate in the doctor's ward dropped to around the same level as the midwife's ward. Semmelweis insisted all childbed fever was caused by cadaveric matter or decomposing animal matter, which didn't make any sense. Childbed fever was a very old infection that appeared in home births as well as the midwives ward at the Vienna General Hospital, where cadaveric or decomposing animal matter was not a factor. Making sure doctors washed their hands after autopsy was one way to reduce childbed fever, but Semmelweis alienated his colleagues by insisting it was the only way, which didn't seem likely to them. The importance of hand washing for medical professionals didn't really become understood until scientists hit upon germ theory the idea that certain diseases and infections are caused by microorganisms. In particular, the British surgeon Joseph Lister drastically improved patient mortality by advocating that surgeons wash their hands and sterilize their equipment in between patients. Today, medical and health professionals consider hand washing a critical hygienic practice, both for themselves and their patients. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, even provides guidelines for how to properly wash one's hands. To properly kill germs, the CDC advocates scrubbing hands with soap for at least 20 seconds before rinsing the soap off with water. Drying them completely is also important since wet hands spread germs more easily. In summary, these are the steps that Semmelweis and his successors followed to arrive at the life-saving practice of hand and instrument sterilization. The process of critical thinking. Observing. One notices something. Feeling. One feels puzzled or uncertain about something. Wondering. One formulates a question to be addressed. Imagining. One thinks of possible answers. Inferring. One works out what would be the case if a possible answer were assumed. Knowledge. 
one uses stored knowledge of the subject matter to generate possible answers or to infer what would be expected on the assumption of a particular answer. Experimenting. One designs and carries out an experiment or a systematic observation to find out whether the results deduced from a possible answer will occur. Consulting. One finds a source of information, gets the information from the source, and makes a judgment on whether to accept it. Identifying and analyzing arguments. One notices an argument and works out its structure and content as a preliminary to evaluating its strength. Judging. One makes a judgment based on accumulated evidence and reasoning. Deciding. One decides on what to do or on what policy to adopt. Hello, my name is Mark Vassell, and I'm the Honorary Consul General for Austria and Montreal. I'd like to speak to you today about the Austrian Service Abroad Program. This program is a non-for-profit organization funded entirely by the Austrian government. This organization provides opportunities for young Austrians to travel abroad and to work with various organizations around the world. There are three different sections of the Austrian Service Abroad Program. One is the Holocaust Commemoration or the Gedenkdienst Program. This was founded by Andreas Meisinger. The second is a social services program. And the third is the peace program. In my service as Honorary Consul General, I've had the opportunity to work with these young Austrians who make an incredible impact on our community here in Montreal, educating young students, uh, working with survivors, and really are truly ambassadors of Austria. Wir sind heute in der Hofburg gewesen und sind vom als Gedenk- und Friedens- und Sozialdienerinnen und Diener vom Bundespräsidenten verabschiedet worden. Über den österreichischen Auslandsdienst gehe an die Holocaust Education and Genocide Prevention Foundation. Als Österreicherin hat man eine gewisse Verantwortung aus der Vergangenheit und einfach da seinen Teil dazu beitragen, dass das nicht mehr passiert und diese Verantwortung irgendwie wahrzunehmen. I, I always felt some kind of a moral responsibility, one can call it. And I think it, it's just important to like go out in the world and talk to people and, and tell them what, what actually happened. And maybe to actually educate them about what happened so that the history just doesn't repeat itself. My family is in part, um, was a Nazi family, a Nazi family, and grandfather was in the National Socialist Educational System, one of the mines. And when I learned about the Gedenktins program, I really liked the aspect of, no, we, Austria, we were not the victims of the Third Reich, we were perpetrators. And when there are perpetrators, where are the victims? The, the main task was to, to actually teach about the Holocaust or other genocides. So for example, I went to colleges and spoke to peers in my age and talked to them about the Holocaust and what happened, but also about the, the dangers of prejudice and racism in general. And it was really impressive for me to see that there's a difference for the students when someone in their age is coming from Austria, talking to them about the history of, of one's country. And it, 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 was, it just felt different somehow. Also, the teacher told me afterwards, Ben, how, how did you do that? Why did they listen to you? And I think that's just because it's a different story somehow. Because, yeah, I'm, first of all, I'm the eighth. And second of all, I'm from the country talking about the history. I was teaching at a orphanage village at an SOS, it's an Austrian association, the SOS uh, Children uh, Village Association, and they have a school there, uh, which is a corporation with another institution. Uh, we were at the orphan village, orphanage village itself. We were there uh, playing with the children, actually, uh, spending time speaking uh, English with them. And also I did some conversational English classes there um, as it is uh, quite in the countryside, the place I was in the northeast of China, uh, the English teacher in those days, it was like uh, 15 years ago, they had never been abroad, so their English abilities were quite limited. And so it uh, was a help for them to talk to a foreigner in English language. Yeah. 
Then uh, I worked uh, at the Montreal Holocaust Memorial Center in the archives. We moved then a little bit into the office area, into the education area, where we met Naomi Kramer, who was the education director then. And we started to work on uh, education program, programs about, um, well, who, about hate and propaganda put into the year 2000 into the internet. Internet was booming and there were all kinds of hate sites and we developed a program how to uh, recognize that that's a hate site. Uh, hate on the internet, like on website, colors, fonts, how do you... Uh, is not a topic anymore. Um, now it's within the, the all interactions, even within friends and families, uh, this, is it this way or is it that way? And there's a huge divide. Is it the Republicans in the US or the Democrats? Is it Trump or Biden? Is it uh, pro-corona uh, measurements like lockdowns or is it corona denying? Um, this is a new flavor, uh, which is really, I think, a tough one, actually. It's, it's because it, it really disconnects people and do they, I mean, you meet someone uh, not wearing a mask or not wearing a mask uh, against coronavirus properly, like the nose coming out. You know, it's the person from the other side of the divide. <laughs> you see the other countries differently, but also you see your own country differently when you come back. It's like uh, you come back and it's the, the bigger uh, cultural shock when you come back than when you go abroad, because then it's uh, like you understand what you are. It's like a mirror for the first time you uh, see and feel what it is that makes you Austrian. What is the Austrian part, the culture part on your personality? And that's an uh, important uh, experience, I think, yeah. And one really interesting thing I really learned afterwards, when I was home in Vienna, um, I learned a lot of em uh, English words to describe emotions. Um, obviously, in my family, I did. I, in, obviously, in my family, I did not learn too many words to describe your own emotions in German. So, after a couple of years, um, whenever I, uh, I I'm, I'm searching for a proper word to describe an emotion, most likely it's the English word which comes to me, which results from the work there in Montreal. I mean, there's one thing which, which is probably interesting, um, because I thought about what, what's, what's the overall or underlying um, problem. And I think after, uh, I think it's the, it's the people looking to the power of interpretation. They want to be able to interpret what they experience and what they um, feel. And interpretation means they're looking for some kind of truth. And what I learned, and what I learned also in Montreal, that there are four kinds of truths. My truth, yours, the way it really was, and the way it's written in the books. And people tend to think there is a truth. In science, probably, people don't know. We, many, many of us don't know that science does not produce truth. They produce the best story on the system. And whenever there is a better one, they replace it by the better one. But as long as um, the better one is not there, it's the best story interpreted as truth, which is not correct. I think it's safe to say that the Holocaust and the murder of six million Jews could not have occurred without the propaganda, the Nazi propaganda machine. They were able to spread lies. They were able to convince people that the Jews were their enemies. And this was a slow, deliberate process uh, that effectively brainwashed uh, Germany and Austria to allow them to carry out the execution of six million people. Today, we are faced with a different type of propaganda. Um, it's less subtle, it's pervasive, 
through the internet, through social media, through blogs, through Twitter, through newspapers, everybody has a voice. Anybody can have a voice. And we have to question whose voice is this? What is their agenda? Who do they represent? It's, it's just imperative to think critically. It's imperative to think about their motivation. What is their agenda? What is their objective? I mean, and we have, to un- we have to look at their sources. We have to see who they are. And if we're not asking these questions, that is the real danger. That is the threat. Because if we're not asking questions, if we're not understanding who is speaking, we can certainly fall victim to, to, to an agenda that will slowly take control as it did uh, in Nazi Germany.